QM guys, and welcome to another episode of Q&A on Coin Bureau Clips. And as you can see today, I'm joined by none other than Guy, the crypto guy. How are you doing, Guy? I'm back. I'm back. Yes, You're I'm back. well. Yeah, congratulations, by the way. On what? Guy made some profits on Silly Dragon. Baby oh, Dragon yes, this week. Baby Dragon. Baby Dragon this yeah. week, and he's been chuffed the whole week. His, <laughs> his Dragon Coin thesis actually played off. Not yeah. in the way you thought it would. No. But it got into profit, right? Yeah. So I thought, I thought this... I thought these stupid dragon themed meme coins would do well uh, about around Chinese New Year, which was over a month ago now, yeah, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah. So I bought a couple it was a of delayed New Year yeah. celebrations. Um, so I thought they'd pump on that, and they did the opposite. They they absolutely dumped. Good too. Uh, you rode that dragon on the way I, down. Yeah. And you rode it on the way up. And I rode it back up. Downs. Yeah. Mm. I'm actually still holding some baby dragon, I should say, but okay. I I took profit on it, so I'm you know I've made some money. Well, congrats, trader of the week. <laughs> Thank you. Um, okay, yeah, thanks, guys. Uh, as usual, uh, some people have been sending in questions on Instagram. We've picked out a few to answer. And I'm going to kick off by asking Nick a question from Sosa Diva. This is one I'm sure a lot of people out there are asking. Is it too late to buy BTC? Mm. Have we missed the boat? Nick? Have we missed the boat? Damn. Mm. How many times I would have got that question in the past? <laughs> to how many cycles? Mm. I hark back to those days in March 2017, actually. And uh, Bitcoin was trading at $1,000. And this is when I was first, I'd got into crypto a few months before that. One of my mm. friends said, nah, Bitcoin's been rallying. There's no way. So we've missed the boat on this one. It's a bit too late to buy. I was like, mm. Mm. well, to be honest, I think that it depends what your buying thesis is and depends what you, what you think crypto, cryptocurrency is trying to do. And that was $1,000, right? Yeah. And I've had so many of these times in different cycles, people asking me, is Bitcoin, is it too late to buy? And I guess the question is, no, it depends what time frame you're looking at, obviously. Mm. I mean, no one's going to guarantee you that price is going to continue going up in this cycle up till, you know, a lot of the gains have already been had, but there's no guarantee it can continue going up infinitely for now. But the question is over the, you know, longer time period, you've got to ask yourself why you invest in Bitcoin and also what is the alternative? Mm -hmm. You see that Michael Saylor comment when he, when that, to that anchor this week about if you choose to put savings in fiat. Yeah. You know, it was yeah. ungracious, you up, like you end up poor. Mm. But it's true because of inflation. So it's like, okay, what are you going to not be, what are you going to be holding your store of value as? Is it going to be fiat if you're not investing? So it's all about time frame, and it's all about why you invest in and, what, and why you hold in Bitcoin and, your lo and the longer-term perspective you have to have. So it is never too late. But bear in mind, of course, yes, there is a chance things could fall. I mean, mm. it's I'm, very volatile in case yeah. you haven't noticed. Yeah. I think if you've done your research into Bitcoin, if you understand what it is and its long-term value proposition, then it's never too late. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. There you are. Okay, cool. what's the next one then? The question is from Agustin Hosera, and he's asking, if Ethereum ETF gets approved, can it take Bitcoin's market share? Hmm. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, I should start off by saying that... It, it's looking more and more likely that these Ethereum ETFs won't be approved in May. I think the, the chances of that have sort of declined a lot since all the euphoria, euphoria around the Bitcoin spot ETFs um, back in January. I think uh, it was kind of taken for granted that the Ethereum ETFs were the natural sort of next step. Um, from what we've been hearing, that's much less likely now. I think 30%. Is yeah. the latest, and uh, I mean the the Bloomberg guys were saying ninety percent for ninety five percent, ninety five percent for Bitcoin. For, for Bitcoin. So thirty so. percent. I don't think those are great odds. I think we will get Ethereum ETFs eventually, but I don't think it'll be in May, and it might not be this year. Yeah, there's no. still a long way to go. So, um, but that's not the question. If Ethereum ETFs get approved, can they uh, can they take Bitcoin's market share? I don't. I don't think so. I think that would be, I, I think there's, there's enough of a difference between Ethereum and Bitcoin for most investors. I don't think it's a case of, uh, of one or the other. Mm. I, think, uh, I think some people will you know, choose to stay all Bitcoin and other people will be more attracted by, by what Ethereum can do. So I'm not sure that they'll cannibalize each other's market share. I don't think it's either or. Yeah, no, I agree. Um... So yeah, I mean, for sure, with your point around the fact that the chances of an Ethereum ETF, uh, it doesn't seem likely because, I mean, I also put a research post about this. There's numerous factors, obviously, not just the fact that the back and forth, right? Mm. There's no back and forth going on between yeah. the SEC and these providers like there was with Bitcoin. 
you also have the fact that there's the security status that hasn't been settled. Yeah. And there's a pecu peculiar small like um, technicality around the rule changes required for ETFs for Ethereum as compared to Bitcoin. So those are many of the factors. But in terms of the question around whether we'll take Bitcoin market share, I don't think so. And another, this is another factor that many people haven't thought about. And that is whether there will actually even be demand for the Ethereum ETFs yeah. when they go live. But yeah. let's not forget that last year we had the Ethereum futures ETFs. And those were a bit of a flop. <laughs> yeah, right? total flop. So a total flop. And I was listening also to Eric Balkunas, one of the guys on the Laura Shin podcast. And he was saying that the retail investors and the institutions that are buying into Bitcoin right now through these ETFs, they doing they view Bitcoin as like their exposure to crypto, right? Mm -hmm. They're just getting into Bitcoin, into crypto. It's their gateway drug and they're happy with it. And they see Bitcoin as the standard for the crypto industry. It's not what we in crypto natives see it as, but it's how they view it through their investment uh, thesis. And as such, they're not necessarily looking to diversify into altcoins. And there's one more fact that actually was mentioned in uh, the interview I did with uh, Vettel Lunda from K33. And this mm. is actually a potential concern for Ethereum around these ETFs. And this is, if there isn't demand for the ETFs out the gate, let's not forget that if Grayscale is able to convert yeah. their Ethereum trust into an ETF, remember the Grayscale outflows because of the, ar the arbitrage trade on the, on the discount as it goes up? Mm. You have massive outflows coming from Grayscale on Ethereum and no inflows, or well, not yeah. a high enough inflows to counteract that, what's that going to do to Ethereum's price? Yeah. So that's a potential tail risk out there. So yeah. yeah, long story short, I don't think it's going to take away market share. And in fact, I think it's probably not going to see as much excitement as Bitcoin, at least not right now. Yeah. Later on when it is, and a lot more crypto investors are involved. But yeah. Yeah. I think there's also the question with Ethereum ETFs around yield, isn't there? Because you don't mm. get any native yield yeah, with Bitcoin. Exactly. Ethereum, you can stake it, you can earn, was it 4% or something like yeah. that? Now, the, you would imagine that some of the big buyers of ETFs would be institutions. I mean, it's, yeah. it's a lot of institutions have been buying the spot Bitcoin ETFs. Would they be so willing to buy an ETF of an asset that they could otherwise stake and earn a yield on? Institutions yeah, love exactly. earning yield. I mean, lots of investors love earning yield. Exactly. So, and there's also the question, some of these ETF providers have said that, oh, we'll try and we're going to try and provide staking yield from mm. these products. But it's also that complicates it right a lot. Yeah. Because then we're talking into the like, remember that Coinbase was sued because of their earned product, which yeah. gave ETH yield. So it's like, how is the SEC going to view an ETF that's getting this yield? You right. Yeah. So it's going to complicate it a lot. So if it's going to be anything, probably be a spot with no yield, which then it comes back to the point, why would they do this if they can get a native ETH yield from staking normally? Yeah. I'm sure the SEC are absolutely loving having to <laughs> having to try and yeah. try and unpick the uh, the ins and outs of yeah. uh, ETH ETFs. They'll be the the Bitcoin ones must look uh, easy by comparison. Okay, SAB six asks, what will happen in Bitcoin halving? Will the market crash and will we see a bear market again? Bitcoin halving, mm. remember, is about a month right, away right, now. Right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so this is actually an interesting question because. Um, for firstly, generally, in the past, there's been a bit of a sell the news on the halving, right? Mm. Because people, obviously, the halving's a date that everyone knows they can buy and accumulate to be before it, and then they try and close out of their trades once the halving has come, right? So that's generally what happens in the past and what has happened in the past. And generally, people like to try and look at the past and see, can we try and predict the future from it? And actually, there was actually a um, research report by Coinbase that was released mm. about a few days ago that took a look at the halving impact this year and previous halving cycles. And what they've basically tried to, what they, the thesis they have is that basically previous halving cycles happened with many other variables in no particular point in time that you can't really extrapolate out. In other words, it's very hard to find a solid relationship between what happens to price after these halvings, mm -hmm. right? And so what's happened this year and in this halving that has changed a lot about the Bitcoin cycle and the Bitcoin market, obviously. It's ETFs, the, it's ETFs yeah. right? So, Here's a, here's a thing to think about, um, and they have this in the report, and I'll link to it as well. But if you assume now there's been about $6 billion, February had about $6 billion of net inflows to Ethereum, ET, or not to Bitcoin ETFs, right? Mm -hmm. If we even assume that inflows slow to $1 billion a month, right? And post halving, Bitcoin emissions mined are mm -hmm. about 13,500 Bitcoin you know, per month. So if we do a bit of quick maths, right, like 13,500 Bitcoin, 70,000 price of Bitcoin, average price raise right now, we're talking about 900, $950 million of emissions, mm -hmm. but $1 billion of, out, of inflows, yeah. demand. So all things held equal, right? Price should kind of like be stable. And so they said the equilibrium price is about $74,000. So 
this is something that's different. But then, of course, the question is, you know, are inflows only going to slow to a billion? Yeah. Or do you think they're going to pick up? Or do you think something else is going to come along? Another important date to watch, by the way, um, is May 15th. Uh, Matt Hogan, who's the CEO of Bitwise, basically said all these funds that have got about more than $100 million in AUM, they will file about whether they're thinking about adding Bitcoin to their exposure. Oh, so that's an important date to put into your calendars as well. That's, that's just after the halving. So that could be mm. an important change. So the thing is, it's hard to try and take it, extrapolate out what happened in previous halvings. Is it going to happen this year? Lots of things have changed. The ETFs have changed the market cycle. So I, first of all, I don't think that we'll have a market crash. No. There could be some t- profit taking, a little bit of profit taking. But def- I don't think we'll see a bear market. Yeah. I don't know if you no. agree with that. Tom. I do agree with that. I think as well, I think maybe the big impact of the halving will be it's kind of, it's one of these factors that I think media likes to pick up on mm. and say, you know, today is, a, you know, this is a big moment in, in the Bitcoin cycle because this is when the supply cuts in half. That's a fairly easy dynamic yeah, yeah. For, for people to understand. So I think maybe... Although it'll likely be a sell the news event, I think it will it will sort of alert more people to yeah. Bitcoin, and there, and there, I think there will be yeah. that. It does help to stoke FOMO. People will be like, "Hang yeah. on a sec, what the, the the inflation rate of this has just been cut in half? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's crazy. There's going to be less narrative. of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So the narrative so, could drive it as well. That's a yeah. good point. But I think it will probably. I mean, well, my instinct says post halving it'll be sort of fairly flat and then start to pick up. Mind you, the you know that was kind of what I thought with the ETFs, and I was dead wrong on that. So mm. it could be, you know, it could go absolutely it ballistic. Could be up, who knows? Yeah, um, some people think it's just going to go, um, yeah, vertical, like 100k well, past this post this year, right? 100k easy this year, but yeah. like I, I mean, yeah. Anyway, watch out for it because yeah. it's it is going to be a big event, and it will be fascinating to see the market dynamics around it, and it, really interesting to see how much it gets picked up in the in the sort of yeah. wider media and and the wider consciousness, and to see whether it completely invalidates previous halving cycles. Yeah, yeah. which it could very well. Yeah, yeah. cool. Okay. Uh, the next question is from Mr. Neil Goldstein, and he's asking thoughts on the CPI report with those funny googly eyes. Oh yeah. <laughs> Um, thoughts on CPI? Yeah, well, it was it came in a little bit hotter than mm. we expected, didn't it? But I mean, only by only by one point. So yeah, slightly only was, one point. Yeah, yeah, it wasn't a shocker. Hardly catastrophic, um, and also a little bit up on the previous month. Yeah, yeah. But. So I think what and the market kind of shrugged it off. Really, I didn't I didn't see any sort of widespread effect. So obviously, it kind of reminds us that inflation is still a thing. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not, and it's not. Well, I mean, it's getting near, but it's not at that 2% target with the Fed. So what I think that's, that tells us is the Fed meeting is in a few days' time. It's, it's on the 20th, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. So, so this week, yeah, yeah this Q&A is out. You'll get it this week. Um, mm. The question is, yeah, is, is inflation sticky, right? Yeah. Because I think that in the Jan- when the January numbers came out, there was the question, oh, this is this potential seasonality mm. going on. But um, now, because February is also slightly hot here, there's a question of, is it sticky, right? Yeah. And the PCE numbers are still at 2.4%, so it's still way above the Fed's target of 2%. Yeah. Um, Paul was in a meeting, was it this week, where he was basically saying data-dependent, data-dependent, you know, the old trope. So, yeah, I mean, I mean, it's likely that in June, there's still fog target and pivot, right? And this mm-hmm. is all what the reason inflation is important is, important is because it impacts on what the Fed policy is, right? And yeah. if there's going to be pivot in June, Still about a thirty, it's about thirty percent chance there's no pivot, but you know that could change. Yeah. So we'll see. But yeah, altogether it wasn't anything spectacular. Yeah. You know. I guess it will probably be more of the same from Powell at this next meeting. Yeah. You know, data dependent, two percent target. But everyone will be watching that, including us, will be watching yeah. that press conference that he gives after the meeting to kind of just gauge how hawkish or dovish yeah. he is. You know, how bullish or bearish. Yeah trying to just pass those signs and, you know, see if it... Because at the end of the day, as Nick says, everyone's looking towards these rate cuts yeah. coming at some point, which they most likely will, yeah. but it's, it's just when. I was trapped inside a cage, a cage made out of the daily grind. I was so unfulfilled. I felt like a blank sheet of A4 paper. Something was missing from my life, but I didn't know what. But then... I found what I'd been missing. The Coin Bureau deals page was the answer to my prayers. It had everything I needed to make me complete. Exchange sign-up bonuses of up to $50,000. 
the biggest discount on the best hardware wallets. Trading fee discounts of up to 60% on the best crypto exchanges. Exclusive Outcoin Alpha. Thank you, Coin Bureau, for bringing me back to life. Okay, Glasses Jack asks, how do you decide on price ranges to buy alts? I put my... <laughs> <laughs> just magical okay. pray to the gods. Yeah. <laughs> well, just like, um, yeah, it's a very difficult one because it's, it depends on the alts um, as well. Um, I mean, there's a few ways you can look at it. First of all, the question is price ranges to buy. The goal is what are you trying to do when you buy? And you're obviously thinking, is it going to go up in price, right? Yeah. Um, if you're talking about it from there's ways in which you can look at pricing things. I mean, the fundamentals, you can look at fundamentals, right? So you mm -hmm. can look at things like at least protocol level fundamentals, things like TVL, transaction, throughput, fees, new addresses, that kind of stuff, which is kind of like on-chain fundamental stuff. Mm -hmm. Weigh up the TVL versus the market cap and then try to look at it from the perspective of kind of like a financial model of some description. But that's very rarely, um, you know, solid analysis. You need to take, sometimes people look at like the technicals, right? So technicals mm. are important because they look at relative value based on previous time. That's most of what technical analysis is. Looking at charts, looking at, you know, levels based on where it was in the past. And is it overbought or underbought? If it's underbought, uh, then, you know, it could be a value right now. Um, but then after, to be honest, a lot of the times it's like something can be incredibly overbought, could have mm. rallied by, you know, 100%, 200% already, and it will keep going. And that's, that's where, you know, a lot of the fundamental analysis, a lot of the, you know, uh, deep, deep, deep analysis goes out the window when you have to just think about, is this going to keep on rallying? And then that's looking at stuff like narrative, community. Is there going to be a sex listing? Um, you know, yeah. is there partnerships coming along? What's the, you know, you know, is there a lot of excitement, social sentiment? Mm. So that's the kind of thing you can look at if you're thinking about whether it's a buy. But trying to give you a point and say this is an underpriced or overpriced cryptocurrency. Yes, you can look at the fundamentals. Yes, you can look at the technicals. But sometimes crypto doesn't follow uh, your deep yeah. underlying analysis. Yeah. I think uh, Nick mentioned sex listings, listings on centralized exchanges. I think that's a big, big thing to look out yeah, for, especially exactly. at this stage of the bull market, because we keep talking about new retail coming into the space. They are, by and large, not going to, they're not going to head to, to DEXs. Yeah. And they're going to stick, by and large, with exchanges that they're comfortable with and have a broad reach. So mm -hmm. the likes of Coinbase and Kraken, for yeah, instance, exactly, you know, yeah. that are big, in, especially in the United States, but elsewhere as well. So I think, you know, obviously, and that, that, should, that should inform you one way or the other. Like, if it's already listed on Coinbase, then you could argue that it's already had that exposure. Yeah. And that's when, that's when you should always look at the age of a project as well. Because yeah. sometimes you think, oh, this is on Coinbase and it's got a low price tag. Retail yeah, are going to love that. And then you look and you like, this has been around for three cycles. And the next week, it's and like it's, Coinbase says, we delist in the coin that you yeah, just bought. <laughs> yeah. So, but of, often I think, you know, if, um, if it hasn't got a listing on one of these big retail friendly exchanges, then that can be a real positive because if that listing duly comes, mm. then that can, be, that can be huge. So that's something to look out for as well. And again, like age of the project, obviously you can see very easily on CoinGecko or CoinMarketCap how, how far a token or a coin is from its all time high. And that can obviously give you an idea of how much room it potentially has to grow. But mm. I think you need to be looking, especially, like I said, at how many cycles it's been around for. Because if, it, if it's old, if, it's, mm. if it peaked back in 2017 or 2021, you know, that, um, or it's been around for sort of two cycles or even more, then yeah. that, should, that suggests to me that it's probably run its course. It's two cycles and it hasn't picked up a lot of interest in NGMI, guys. I'd, yeah. I'd, at least, I think, you know. Yeah. Um, Taylor, who is the editor-in-chief of the Coin Bureau blog, the Coin Bureau website, yeah. wrote a really good piece uh, which was published on MSN recently oh, yeah, of course, yeah. um, about shiny new things and how people in crypto love shiny new yeah. things. And it's a brilliant piece. I do urge that you read it. We'll leave a link down below. Um, but he's absolutely right. It is a feature of crypto. People yeah. love new stuff and old stuff tends to go out the window, yeah. even if fundamentals are strong. Even if, you know, this is something that's been battle tested and been around for a while, people love the new. So that's something to bear in mind. It's actually also interesting, a thought, you know, it's not just new things, but it's the new way of telling the same story. Yeah. Because, you know, interesting now how crazy and exciting Deepin is, right? Yeah. 
But if you think about like and some of these pro- some projects within Deepin, it's kind of like IoT internet of things. <laughs> and if you remember back in 2017 cycle, Yo- IOTA was like everyone was excited about IOTA. It really crushed it and everything, yeah. and this whole idea of the tangle. All these machines can interoperate with each other and pay for each other. Yeah. And then it kind of like I don't know where IOTA's have gone. Um, you know, rest in peace if it's still around. <laughs> uh, if it's, but uh, yeah, now there's Deepin. There's a lot of exciting projects launching the Deepin space around IoT concepts. So. It is interesting that, yeah. you know, just changing the wrapper in which something, and also security tokens and RWAs. Yeah. Security tokens, they crushed into, in 2017 and then in 2018, there was no, in the 2020 cycle, there was no way to be seen. But now RWAs is around. And of course, RWAs is the new note that everyone's excited about. So it's just changing the wrapper. It's kind of like the or the way the story is told. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. all storytelling at the end of the day. <laughs> IOTA, IOTA is still around. It's They did some deal with the... Um, and oh, really? it's in Abu Dhabi recently. So they are still kind of going. But it's, yeah, it's really interesting because like Internet of Things was huge. Like our toasters were going to be talking to our fridges. Yeah, and, and they were going to be paying each other transaction fees yeah. <laughs> using the tangle. And it's like somehow that's... On the fridge, you're going to buy people... something that's going to use the MIO to, to buy food from, you know, the Carrefour or something like yeah. that. You know? Yeah, it was, you were never going to run out of milk again yeah. because your fridge would order it for you. And, and we ran out of milk. A couple of days ago, Mrs. Mm. Guy hasn't got any more, and she's furious because she can't have her cereal in the morning. Wow. Okay. So, so come on, guys. Yeah, come you know, on, we, let's get we this need stuff. this. We need this sorted out. Cool. On to the next question, and this is from Lauren. Ho. I think you pronounce it Lorinio. Lorin. Lorinio twenty two. That's my. Best I was. Name. Yeah. I was. <laughs> <laughs> if I completed that, it wouldn't have sounded right. <laughs> Put I apologize. Your own your I apologize. <laughs> Lorinio 22, 22 asks, <laughs> apologies. Should we worry about price manipulation? Are we about to get our pants pulled down by Lorinio? <laughs> <laughs> Good question, Lorinio. Yeah, I mean, well, price manipulation in crypto has been going on ever since ever since crypto became a thing. Yeah. Um, I think probably the meme coin rallies that we've seen recently. I my guess is that there was a lot of price manipulation by whales going on behind yeah, the scenes yeah. there. So should we worry about it? I mean, I think, I think being aware that it goes on and that it happens is, is certainly something that you, that you need to bear in mind. And it should remind you that, especially if you see, if you see something that, you, that you've invested in, that's something that you've bought, if you see it pumping like crazy, I think if you have that knowledge that it could be perhaps artificial, then that should remind you that it's probably a good idea mm. to take some profits mm. on it because the game is being, you know, there's, a, there's another game being played that you're not a part of. But the way you win is if you take profits off the table. Yeah, so right. that's always something uh, to bear in mind. Price manipulation, like, I mean, that makes it sound like it's not a problem and it kind of is. And it was, I mean, it was one of the things that the SEC was talking about for ages when they were, yeah. when they were refusing permission for the ETFs. They were worried about, you know, manipulation in, in the spot market, um, despite the fact that it's a thing in yeah. traditional yeah. finance as well. It's not something that's unique to crypto. Um, so I think you need to be aware of it and you need to be wise to it. And it should remind you to take profits, if nothing else. Do you, do yeah, you agree with I, it? Yeah, I I agree in the fact that for sure Bitcoin whales have been around for some time. And in the Bitcoin markets in the previous cycles, 2017, there was a lot of manipulation going on. Like mm. they could easily manipulate the markets because it was still at that same stage a relatively nascent market, right? Which yeah. allows for that. And that's why some altcoins are still allowed. So there is particular potential manipulation going on there because there isn't too much uh, oversight over it. Um, in terms of if you if he's asking more broadly around this comes back to your point about the SEC and uh, what they why they weren't allowing the ETFs because of the concerns around it. I think more broadly the chances of any sort of manipulation going on in the, the main Bitcoin markets is very 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 slim. We just seen it right now. There's so much the people who buying into it aren't you know crypto whales. It's not crypto mm. natives. It's the ETFs. It's, it's institutions, funds, re, uh, these massive allocators of capital. And let's not forget that in order to have get to get the SEC, the approvals of these ETFs, the SEC required very comprehensive surveillance sharing agreements (SSAs) mm. between the exchanges, and that would be able to flag any sort of you know wrongdoing or you know red flags going on in these exchanges where a lot of the spot trading takes place and market makers. So, the, I, to answer your question, I don't think there's manipulation going on in Bitcoin markets. I don't think that there's someone out there, Mr. Wyckoff Whale, you know, <laughs> tricking you to come and pick up and buy. Bitcoin uh, that's going to dump on you. 
But in the smaller, smaller cap, altcoins, meme coins, that kind of stuff, if you see some price action that sounds fishy or it looks fishy, um, you probably know, is. Probably is, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Bitcoin is a much more sophisticated market now, but you know, altcoins and yeah. what have you are less so. Okay, Rafit asks, Bitcoin roll-ups, exclamation roll mark. What do you know? Roll-ups, um, you know. yeah. Uh, so what do I know? What do I know about roll-ups? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, um, so what I, what I do know is today, obviously, if you guys, quick t- uh, you know, uh, overview what a roll-up is, obviously it's an off-chain scaling solution, an L2 scaling solution where all transactions are bundled together, i.e. rolled up, hence the term, and then settled at the main chain. It obviously helps for scalability and it puts less congestion on the main chain when it's sending the data and posting the data. Two different types of roll-ups, ZK roll-ups, optimistic, and they differ in terms of the way they conduct their fraud checks. I won't go into the, 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 all that detail right now. In terms of Bitcoin rollups, more specifically, it's an interesting point because the question of oh, if we scale in, scale in L2s on Bitcoin, right? Now, currently, mm-hmm. the biggest L2 network on Bitcoin is Lightning, right? But that's mm-hmm. a sidechain solution. And I don't know if you remember in the ordinal craze in 2022, in the big ordinal craze, Lightning actually got quite congested, right? Mm. And then there was people questioning, okay, what other sort of scaling solutions are there that is because as opposed to a sidechain? And what the BitV- BitVM with Bitcoin Virtual Machine allowed for is these other types of scaling L2 solutions, like rollups. And um, it's actually quite interesting because we, we in Singapore, we met um, a team oh, yeah. we were building on a Bitcoin, Bitcoin rollup, uh, B squared network, I believe. Mm. We actually, they actually reached out, we're speaking to them soon. And they also are, they build in a Bitcoin uh, roll-up solution, uh, and it's uh, and it's really interesting. And uh, I think that generally, I think the whole roll-ups and, and L2 space in Bitcoin, the whole BRC20 ecosystem, is really really exciting. I think the Bitcoin L2 space is going to be a hot one this 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 cycle. So it's yeah. something to watch as well. Yeah, it's yeah, and of course made all the more interesting by the by the division within the Bitcoin mm. community over, you know, whether this is a thing or, you know, there yeah. are purists on one side. Don't and like it. It, yeah, do, it does seem to be developing into what Nick Carter, I think, calls the sort of second civil war. Yeah, I guess going on. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I, it's, it's, certainly, it's certainly one to watch because the Bitcoin, the idea that suddenly you might be able to do the same sort of things on Bitcoin uh, that you were that you are able being able to do on Ethereum yeah. and, and other layer ones for a long time. That is that is kind of fascinating. Um, Leveraging the most you know the part the mo- the strongest and most secure network in the world. Yeah, which yeah. is Bitcoin. Too, There's huge it, yeah. potential if they can if they can get it right. So watch out for. We're that actually speaking to another Bitcoin layer two project later today as well. So oh, really, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh it's gosh, so exciting. Yeah. Well, yeah. there we are. We're, there talking, we are. <laughs> we're talking to lots of people. They're they're getting yeah. themselves out there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, um, um, so the next one is oh, yes. from Coinclusion, and they're asking, "What happens with your crypto if your hardware wallet goes bankrupt?" I presume this is the the, the producer of your I hard, don't know. of um, the hardware. Yeah, if your hardware wallet in... goes, I don't know how hardware wallets go bankrupt. Yeah. Um. <laughs> okay. So yeah, what if the produ- What if the manufacturer of your hardware wallet uh, goes bankrupt? Well, I mean, it shouldn't be a problem because. You know, this is, it's like, for instance, if you were to lose your wallet Mm. entirely, so long as you have the seed phrase, so long as you've kept that safe, then it's pretty easy to regenerate your wallet. I mean, we we actually know people who have lost their devices themselves, but fortunately, they didn't have the seed phrases with them, so they were able to regenerate the wallet and recover their funds. Remember, these assets are all stored, you know, your assets themselves, your crypto itself is not stored on a wallet. You're not holding it on a device. And the manufacturers of these wallets are not holding your assets in any way. Mm. Your assets remain on chain and they will always be on chain and they'll never move from there. What a wallet does is hold your private keys so as you can control those on chain assets. Now, so long, like I say, so long as you have the seed phrase to recover those private keys, you're all good. It doesn't matter whether whether you lose the device or whether the manufacturer goes out of business. You know, those yeah. seed, that, that seed phrase, those private keys will still be securely stored. Um, so look after your wallet and your, your wallet will look after you. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And I think that even if um, it does go bankrupt, the point to point out here is like, the only thing that the heart you need the manufacturer for is, main, is software upgrades. Yeah. Software being the firmware or the actual client program you use to interact with it. So let's hypothetically, Trezor goes bankrupt, doesn't matter, you can still keep on using it as long as the software and hardware interact and work. Mm. And, you know, even if it's fully open source, right? So those, that's why we always make a thing about hardware wallets that are open source. Because mm. if it is open source, 
open source developers can still maintain it if they want yeah. to keep using the hardware wallet. Yeah. So that's another option. And the final option is, of course, yeah, like you mentioned, it, all these wallets are BIP39 uh, standard. So basically means you can regenerate them. It doesn't even have to be the same wallet. It can be in a software wallet, that kind of stuff. So yeah, you're pretty safe in most yeah. cases. Yeah, just make sure you store your private keys securely. Yeah. You lose your private keys, you are screwed. No, no one can help you. Okay, uh, Malibat asks, Kuji, what Luna wanted to be? Kuji. Okay, <laughs> so this is Kajira. Kajira, Kajira, yeah. yeah. So it's interesting, I came across this like last week or so, and I mentioned in the Q&A then, it's obviously, now it's got an interesting back backstory, right? Because mm -hmm. it, did, it did emanate from the Terra ecosystem. It launched on Star Terra. It grew quite big in that ecosystem. And then obviously the Terra collapse mm -hmm. forced him to start looking for other places to build. Um, and the team is actually, I was able to spin to build develop out the Kujera right now, which is on, you know, it's on a built on a Cosmos SDK in like six weeks, right? It's pretty wow. crazy. And now everyone's talking about it, like wondering for themselves, is this going to be like the next injector? Because it's like an, it's a decentralized ecosystem that they're planning to rev revolutionize in fintech. Basically, similar to Injective, you know, dApps can build on top of it. It's run by a DAO. So basically, DAO, dApps can only deploy if voted by the DAO to ensure no rug pulls of that description. In terms of fundamental value, coming back to the question of value in else, I mean, if you believe in that, so um, it's got about 150 million in TVL, whereas Injective's got like 70 million. So mm -hmm. it's double the TVL, and it's only got like a $500 million mark you know, versus Injective's like 4.5 billion. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's undervalued from that perspective. Obviously, there are different projects at different stages, but that's just an important point. I think Kujira, obviously, tokenomics is great in the sense that Kuji, uh, the tokenomics are great because it's obviously all out, all vested out. Um, and the Kuji token, naturally, uh, people who stake in on the network obviously get transaction fees as a part of it as well. Mm. A lot of exciting dApps that are built on it as well. Um, you know, there's Kujira Fin, which is basically an open order DEX on Cosmos. You've got Orca, which is a collateralized, uh, collateralized uh, liquidation for collateral. And then you've got USK, which is a stable coin. So okay. a Terra ecosystem project launching a stable oh, coin, God. right? A USK. Um, okay. It's got some TVL. It's not the mint and burn. It's like a maker equivalent. It's got okay. it's got like a collateral. It's so collateral, look, I mean, it's an interesting project. I think that there's a lot of the, the community is excited excited about mm -hmm. it. It's, it's a cosmos. You know, it does have the potential to be the next injector. The reason everyone's like looking, I want to get the next injector because you've seen what injector has done. Um, I, I think it potentially potentially, uh, but uh, yeah, I think that um, if a cosmos play, if you're thinking about it. Kujira could be look, worth looking into on the okay. ecosystem. Yeah. Bullish on bullish on Kujira. Kuji, yeah. Bullish, bullish on Kuji. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, Nick is Nick knows because he uh, he's made a lot of money on Injective. Oh, so uh, yeah, as, yeah. He, as he likes to remind <laughs> yeah. us. Every um, day. So yeah. yeah. Yeah, and and I've heard I I've have uh, have heard good things about Kujira from sort of people who are more familiar with the Cosmos mm -hmm. ecosystem yeah. than we are. So keep an eye on it, folks. Yeah. Cool. So Jose Seyula ninety three asks. Quella. Quella. Jose. 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 Yeah. That's okay. how I'd say. 93. Okay. <laughs> we should just have a competition where we read through names of people who submit things on Instagram and see who's best to pronounce yeah. it. Yeah. Okay. Jo Jose Quella asks any low cap gems? High risk, high reward. High risk, high reward. Okay. Gosh. Low cap gems. A couple that spring to mind. Uh, these aren't any that I. I'm not really big on low caps apart from. <laughs> Yeah, baby yeah. dragon. <laughs> um, so I haven't, I, I haven't really sort of waded into any low caps uh, recently. So a couple that spring to mind. So if you're looking at deep in, then obviously decentralized physical infrastructure. One of the thing, one of the sectors I notice in that that is starting to get a bit of attention is this kind of decentralized mapping. Mm. Um, so this is where you know you kind of you use your dash cam. And you collect data from that, you upload it, you know, decentralized Google Maps. Now, I think that is a fairly easy narrative to understand. As I understand, the sort of big leader in that space is Hive Mapper, mm. which I think is already fairly big. Yeah. So uh, as I've seen a lot of a lot of our Coin Bureau club members have been talking about a kind of Hive Mapper beta coin, if you mm. like, uh, which is called Atlas Navi. Ooh, that's interesting. So that looks, I haven't got around to sort of properly looking into that and I haven't invested in anything in it yet, but it certainly looks interesting. So Atlas Navi, I think the ticker is NAVI. Navi, so that's, that's that I think one. is pretty low cap and definitely probably yeah, yeah. fairly high risk. So do have a look at that. Nick, what about you? Uh, man, I'm, I don't know if I'm going to regret this, but I'm going to, I'm going to go out on a limb here and maybe a meme coin. It's about to be released. 
Okay. Uh, now I've got to stay, state like fully not financial advice, really high risk, could be a scam. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> I'm just saying because it's, it's, it's going to be airdropped. So that's why. And the reason why it could be a scam or that, but I'm just saying I've heard from a few people that, you know, it's exciting, something to watch. Um, and so not financial advice, all those disclaimers. And I did talk about this a little bit in the Coin Bureau Club subscription um, model as well. But I think that it's a meme coin that's going to be on Cosmos. This okay. will drop into Cosmos addresses in the Injective, in Celestia, Cosmos ecosystem called Harvard Coin. Huh. Now, I basically was having a conversation with some pretty high-powered CEO here in the crypto space. And we had a, it was an in-depth conversation, but we obviously got on the topic of meme coins, as you usually do. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, and uh, he mentioned this, and it was interesting because so, to this date, there hasn't been like a meme coin that's popped off in the Cosmos ecosystem, right? right. Um, and, uh, you know, this is, um, this potentially could be it, potentially, if it gets enough community engagement. It's, uh, like I said, it's airdropping. They've also cut the airdrop allocation by 50% recently, which means more airdrops to users. And, uh, yeah, he said it's got opportunity to potentially be a strong play on the meme coin in our Cosmos ecosystem. I also did chat to CryptoCito about it. Now, yeah. CryptoCito is a Cosmos expert. He also said, like, very risky. He doesn't know, um, you know, the team or anything. And it could, it could be very high risk, and, but potentially high reward as well. Um, it's got some really, you know. So, so from that perspective, it's going to be airdropped to these wallets. You can check. We'll let, leave a link to the, you know, scanner so you can check if your wallet could be eligible. Uh, so it's, it's one of these things where you're, if you interact with an injective cosmos or you know celestial ecosystem you could potentially get it and uh what why do i think i'm slightly bullish in it well obviously the fact that smart people have said could be worth looking to Mm -hmm. also the fact that um it's a dog coin it's a dog obviously it's like um, tick tick and a good twitter game (laughs) tick and also very very large and wide distribution so it's Mm -hmm. a wide ecosystem they're trying to edge up to as many wallets as possible so Naturally, if you've got a large base of users already got the coin just sent to them, uh, they're going to be excited about it. So because it's a free coin they can mm-hmm. trade. So yeah, I mean, you know, obviously, guys, you know, it's DYOR. DYOR on this. I'm probably I'm going to get some in the airdrop to me. Um, it looks interesting, but uh, yeah, I, I, like I say, I can't vouch for it. I can't vouch for it 100. Yeah, so. and of course, I suppose that's kind of interesting in a, in a way in that it's a, going to be a meme coin in the cosmos ecosystem because cosmos isn't really well known for a meme coin yeah exactly and there has been like it's been really interesting hasn't it like over the last few months like solana has become a big sort of yeah. meme coin chain you had a lot there avalanche seems to be coming off a big, you know popping yeah. for meme coins out could cosmos be next yeah. i don't know check it out cool. if you're interested in things like airdrops and you know stuff happening in the cosmos ecosystem and you know just kind of chat like this in general then we have a discord server uh, yeah. where there is lots of this sort of discussion and in that discord uh, server we actually have a dedicated channel called airdrops alpha yeah airdrops alpha. Um, a very good friend of mine runs that and is insanely knowledgeable about what's happening in the airdrop sphere yeah, so you fun. can keep up to date with it there we'll leave a link to our discord in the description um, you can also join Coin Bureau Club as well, as Nick mentioned. Yeah. That's our subscription service that is devoted to altcoins. Um, and there is tons of discussion there. And if you join that, then you get access to special channels within our Discord where yeah. there's this sort of discussion as well. So do check that out. Link below. Okay, final question. Stefan Kugel asks, why are you guys so happy? <laughs> why are you so happy, Nick? Why am I so happy, man? Why am I smiling? Why am I smiling all the time? Well, you look isn't isn't so it obvious, guys? Cool. Isn't it obvious? <laughs> if your net worth 5x is in five months, <laughs> that can make anyone happy, you know? Yeah. I mean, browser tabs filled with uh, Lambo dealers, Rolex dealers, you know? <laughs> it's an injective again. <laughs> you know, um, I'm manifesting. I'm manifesting. You're manifesting. Yeah. No, no. yeah. I'm joking. There, there, there's no uh, Lambo dealer tabs there. Yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna have to. I'm gonna have to check his <laughs> check his browser history. Uh, why are we happy? Well, crypto's doing well. Yeah. There's renewed positivity in the industry. It's a, it was a long bear market oh, and it was a tough bear market. And it's just really cool to see people, you know, positive about crypto yeah. again. And obviously, price action plays a bit plays a big role in that. But there just seems to be a lot of good news. Yeah, I think it's also a matter of um, if it's always up markets. So we need bear markets. You need yeah. bear markets. You need tough times. Like anything in life, tough times make the, the, the good times much sweeter. Yeah. And if we hadn't been through the, the really hellish like past two years in terms of the crash and all the other stuff going on, 
um, you wouldn't have had to appreciate how crazy it is and how far we've come. And we've actually, and because we stuck out there, right? You know, mm. people who, you know, some people can, the tourists will come and go, right? Because they don't believe in it. But it's, it's hard to sometimes slog on in these very tough market conditions. And especially, you know, when, when things just aren't going right in any such way. But it's like having that vision and knowing that better times will come. And when the better times do come, just bathing in it and enjoying it and realizing you're gonna, we all gonna make it. Yeah, enjoy it while it lasts, folks. Yeah, because it doesn't last forever. It doesn't. I know. I know we'll have a different perspective on the bear, but you know. Yeah, yeah. Why are you guys so sad? Why are you? Yeah. Why are you always frowning? It's good that people at least notice. You know, as yeah. opposed to the question we got a few weeks ago, which is, "Are you guys happy?" Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Why so happy? Cool. Okay. Thanks, guys. That is another Q and A done for yeah. this week, Nick. Always good. Always good. Always good, always good yeah, to yeah, talk. Yeah, yeah. Um, we will be back. Well, some combination of us. Maybe Jess will be back next week. It's been a while since Jess yeah. did a Q&A, didn't it? Yeah, Better yeah. pick her brains. Yeah. Um, cool. So we'll be back soon. And uh, thank you for sending in questions. Keep those questions coming. See you again See you guys. very Cheers. soon. Bye.